morning church turn to philippians chapter number four philippians chapter four we will read together from verse four to verse seven though we are looking only at verse six and seven for this morning the title is very simple facing anxiety facing anxiety anxiety is worries is concerns Philippians chapter 4, reading from verse 4 to verse 7, and as usual, I'll read from the ESV, and it reads as following. Rejoice in the Lord always, again I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guide your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah and Amen. amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of His word. May He write His eternal truth upon our hearts. You ask yourself a question, how often do you sit back and reflect on how worries affect your life? How often do you sit back and reflect on how worries affect your life? And without a doubt, church, this year has been a good year. Regardless of the challenges, the year has been good. This year has been good only because God has given us throughout the year something of His grace to taste, something of His grace and power to keep us and to lead us. For that reason, we say the year has been good, yet it is unquestionable, church, that most of us, if not all of us, have many things unfolding or had many things unfolding in our lives throughout the year. Many discouragements, many disappointments, many doubts, perhaps silently asking God or blaming God, if you will, asking God why such things happening to me, probably silently questioning God's way of doing things and probably in the midst of all that, you turn or you begin to forget even Jesus' prayer for his church in John 17, actually John 14, verse 27. What did Jesus pray for us? Peace I live with you. My peace I give to you, not the world's peace, not that the world gives to you, I do give. No, I give you the peace that comes from God. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let yourself be afraid. We forget those things when we go through difficult times. Paul also added to our encouragement in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 9. What did the Apostle Paul say to us? What a blessing to have such words from the Apostle Paul himself, who suffered probably more than any person can say in the ministry. Paul says that we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. And you can sense in the words of the Apostle Paul, you can sense in those words of the Lord Jesus Christ promising us that peace. You can sense that actually it has to be God who carry us through times of difficulty. God is the one that has to carry us through life or else we will lose our, 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 our peace. We will lose heart and we will die of anxiety because this life, church, is a life full of anxiety. I believe that it is important for us to have such a message, a message that will remind us something of God's heart. It is important for us to have a message that will lay to rest as it were the anxieties obtained in the course of the year. 
It is one of the reasons that Paul writes to the Philippians. He wants to thank the church first for their unquestionable, unequal, unmeasurable support that he received from them. Especially the, 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 the financial support that he got from them. But Paul does not end there. Paul also aims to take away their worries, if you will. He wants to take away their worries. He wants them to focus unto God. He wants them to know that he also suffered. Wherever he was, he was suffering. He had suffered more pains and more sufferings and sorrows than any person. But the encouragement that Paul is bringing to the church, the encouragement that is carrying Paul through in his own life, is to know this church, which is something that we also should know. That he who has done a great thing in their lives, he who has, a, who has done a great thing in our lives, will keep us and he will keep that great thing until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul warns them of the Judaizers that were, were, were persecuting the church, the Judaizers that were causing so much stress and worries. They, 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 they were things on the outside and the things on the inside that caused so much anxiety to, to this church. Paul's imprisonment caused them to worry. And that is natural. Their leader is in prison, they had to worry. So Paul's imprisonment has brought so much anxiety. The Judaizers, those religious outsiders who wanted to infest the church with false doctrines caused or brought so much anxiety to, to the church. But also, the division and the different opinions that were in the church caused so much disturbance and anxieties among the people. In the first verses of this chapter, you, you, you come across the, 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 the words of the Apostle Paul encouraging the church to bring these two women together that they may have peace with one another because there was divisions, probably just misunderstandings and different opinions, but such things cause so much anxiety. So Paul addressed these issues in the church of Philippi. He tells them that what is most important in life is to have peace. Peace with God and peace with one another. So as Paul draws this letter to its conclusion, here in chapter number 4, Paul tells these Philippians how they should live their lives as the children of God in the midst of an ungodly generation. He tells them in verse 4, when we have read, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I will say rejoice. That is the way of living your life in the midst of an ungodly generation. Rejoicing in the Lord. Yeah, in verse number 6 to 7, Paul then makes a call to a life of a life of no anxiety, a life of inner peace, if you will, which is what I want us to consider this morning. And why is this message good for us this morning? It is good because there has been a series of crises surrounding our existence here in this area. We need to be reminded, in actual fact, of the peace of God, the experience that we have experienced when we came to the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. It is good for us because life itself throughout the year might have erected some temporal tents of anxiety within our own, our own lives. It is important for us because the unknown future might not be promising as you look in the eyes of men. Maybe there is nothing promising, there is nothing good you are seeing in the coming future. Therefore, we need to be reminded of the peace of God that we need to, to, to cover our own hearts. This message is good for us because it can be a message that could be a good and comforting companion as we look forward to the coming year. 2019. We need something that will be something of a perfect companion, something that will walk with us as it were, as we are looking in the coming in the coming year. So there are three beautiful reminders I want us to see from these words of scripture, from the pen of the Apostle Paul, from the heart of this man of God. Three beautiful reminders that would actually accelerate something something from us, something of the peace of God. First, 
Be content. That is the opposite of anxiousness. Be concerned. Verse number six. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. So we're looking at that first part. Be anxious about nothing. Paul calls the church to a careless attitude. They must care less on what the world is throwing at them. I've already told you that they were going through difficult times. But they must have a careless attitude towards what the world is throwing at them. Not to let the cares of this world affect their faith in God. He wants them to be content in the midst of crisis. He wants them to fix their eyes as it were and gaze upon the beauty of heaven and remember all the good things that the Lord has done for them. Church, to be content is not to sit down and do nothing about your situation. That's not what Paul is talking about. It is not to be satisfied with unhappiness. Paul is not calling the church to be satisfied with all the unhappiness that we're going through. But it is in the state of happiness, in the state of the peace of God that surpasses all understanding that Paul wants to draw the church to. It is to have the joy of knowing that God is sovereign even in all difficult situation you are facing. To know that God is able to supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. To supply all of your needs according to his own will. To have that kind of a knowledge. To know that God is on your, is on your side. So church, I know it is not easy to speak such a word. It is not easy to say to someone, be worried about nothing when they go through such difficult times. It is not easy when people live in the midst of death to say, be worried about nothing. It is not easy when people are facing darkness every day, when people sleep without food, when people have no jobs or they have jobs that does not pay. It is not easy to say, do not be worried about anything when people sleep without anything to put in their own mind. When people have legitimate concerns about the, 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 the life that they are living, about the, the, the growth of the country's economy, about all the challenges, it is not easy to say be anxious about nothing when people look at the future and the future is blinking. The future does not show anything that will give to you. But Paul draws his attention and he speaks to this church. He wants to draw them. You can see he wants to draw their attention to God. Above all else, they must fix their eyes to God. The Apostle Paul is speaking to a church, speaking to a church that is going through so much trouble and sorrows. Today is very hot. I'm hoping to speak very less. It's so hot. I'm actually sweating and I have not started to preach. So Paul is speaking to a church in great sorrow and spiritually burdened by what was happening towards the local church at the time. Paul is in prison, I've mentioned that. By nature, the church is worried. There are false teachers around. They are trying to twist God's words to suit their own pockets. They are trying to devour the sheep of God. There are, there are other believers suffering that are not even part of this local church, but they are part of other churches which call upon the name of the Lord. So by nature, it is right, if you, if you will, for people to worry in such a case. But Paul here is not saying that when we have concerns in our hearts and we worry or we look at those concerns, then we have sinned. That's not what the Apostle Paul is saying. Paul is not saying when we have concerns and we fix our minds on those concerns, we have sinned. That's not what Paul is saying. We must be anxious about the state of the church. They had to pray for the church. They had to pray for the apostles. We must be anxious or worried about the state of our own personal lives so that we bring that to God. So this anxiousness that Paul is addressing here, it is to worry to the point of hopelessness. 
to worry to the point of hopelessness. So Paul is condemning such an attitude. Paul is condemning the anxiousness that produce hasty decisions. That is what Paul is coming against here. The anxiousness that leads us to give up on things. The anxiousness that caused Jesus to, to, to the anxiousness that Jesus rebuked Martha for when Martha was always worried about the things that was happening. And then the Lord Jesus Christ says to Martha in Luke chapter number 10, verse 41 to 42, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen to fix her heart. Mary has chosen to show her faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus rebukes Martha for this kind of anxiousness. The anxiousness that leads to hopelessness. The anxiousness that surrounds your heart, that surrounds your mind when someone else gets the job that you wanted. The anxiousness that come upon a local church when other churches are growing in numbers and yours is not growing. That is the anxiousness that Paul is talking about here. To be worried about the things that you personally cannot change but God alone can deal with. Remember Jesus' parable of the soul. Jesus there, he says, it is the case of this life that choked the word of God. It is the anxieties of this life that chokes the word of God. Therefore, we are exhorted here not to have the kind of anxiety that agitate some kind of distrust and lack of faith in God. The, the, the kind of anxiety that agitates the soul as though God has forsaken you. That is what Paul is talking about. Such anxiety is that which slows us down in the ministry of the gospel. We just give up. Whatever we do, the devil changes it around. So we're just going to give up. Cause us to worry every day about the things that is happening outside and the people that have forsaken and left us. And Paul says, no. Let your heart not be overwhelmed with anxiety that will lead you to a state of hopelessness. And the reason for this instruction to be content and not to be troubled with the cares of this life is that when we are born into the kingdom of God, church, when we are born into the kingdom of God, we have the assurance that God will take care of our needs. God has a plan for us. Do we still remember that God has a plan for us? Do we always remember that God is in control? Or do we let our cares and our worries keep us in a state of forgetfulness for a little while? God is in control. Therefore, the message is very simple, church. What Paul is saying to us and to the church back then and today is very simple. The circumstances in your life may appear to be unbearable, but there is hope because Christ is aware of what you are facing. Christ was aware what the church was going through, and Christ is aware what the church today is going through. So Paul is calling the church to have the same attitude as that of Job, when all else failed in his life, when his friends turned against him, when his family turned against him. Job stood up as it were, faced unto heaven, lifted up his hands unto God. I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. Remember those words that he spoke in difficult times. Paul spoke such words also when he addressed Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 12. I know whom I have believed and I am convinced, I am persuaded that he is able to guard until that day that which has been entrusted to me. I know whom I have believed. That is what we need to say in terms of trouble, in terms of worries and anxiety. I know my demands. I know whom I have been. So, the reason why God does not want us to be anxious about anything, it is because anxiety is a direct message to God. Anxiety tells God that we don't believe that He's able to take care of us. 
When we want it to the state of hopelessness, we are sending a message to God that God, you are unable to take care of us. You are unable to lead us when you said you will lead us. You are unable to show yourself to be God. That is the message we are saying when we worry to the point of hopelessness. So we are saying God does not take care of us enough to meet our needs and sustain us through our troubles and trials. But like I said, church, God is not saying we will not be worried. We will be worried about the things. We have been worried about things. The question is, what will you do when anxiety comes in your life and it comes in in your life like a flood? What will you do? Will, will you be a hopeless person? Have a person having nowhere to go? Or is there any source, if you will, any source of strength that you can tap into and draw some strength in times of worries? Are you able to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me? Do you remember his love? Do you remember his comforting hands in times of sorrows and pain, in times of trouble and worries? Do you remember the God who gave his life for you on that hill far away? Do you remember the one who was crucified for your sins? Because if he could carry the cross for you, what are your worries and anxiety in him to carry? Or for him to carry? So Paul says, be content. God is in control. That is what kept us through. And that is what I pray should keep us church until we meet again. Knowing that God is is in control. But secondly, Paul says, be thankful in your request. Be thankful in your request. Verse number six. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So Paul is saying, you will have requests. You will have someone that you trust. You will have someone that you tell all to. You will have this someone that you open your heart and you tell this person your pains and your sorrows. Not because you are worried, but because, church, you trust. This now is a matter of trust. You trust that this person can help you or this person can keep your secret. You trust in the sovereign power of this person. But please notice, you tell this person in prayer and supplications with thanksgiving. That is what Paul is saying. You speak to this person that... You trust in a form of prayer. That's how you speak to him. In supplication, in making requests unto him, but with thanksgiving. And I think that the, the, the angle of thanksgiving is the most important angle to look at this morning. We are living in times when people are not thankful. People are not thankful for what they have. People are not thankful for what God has done for them, they, they, they want more and, and more in life. They, they don't look back and reflect on the goodness of the Lord. We need to be thankful. It is easy to be anxious in this life. It is easy to worry because we have forgotten what the Lord has done for you. You keep looking on the things that are ahead and forget to look on the things that are behind that the Lord has done for you. But if you begin to have that attitude of thankfulness, you begin to tap back as it were and look back and see what the Lord has done for you and be content, as I was saying earlier on. Paul provides then now an answer to anxiety. If you want to fight anxiety, there is an answer. Yes, you can go to a counseling session and, and take some classes but the primary cure is prayer with, thank, with thankfulness to God. Prayer, making your request known to God. That is the primary cure for anxiety. You must open up to God. You must be naked as it were before God in prayer and supplications. You must be carried up by thanksgiving in your heart when you come to God. I think Paul tells us this difficult thing to do in times of distress because it is difficult to be 
thankful when you are in distress and there are worries in your life. But Paul is telling us this thing because Paul knows that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. So we are able to be thankful because all things, you believe that, all things work together for the good for those who are called by his name, who are called for his great purpose. So instead of worrying about the situation you cannot change, Paul says, let your request be made known to God. What we are told here is that there is no situation then to which we should not respond to God in thanksgiving. Please think about what I just said. There is no situation in which you should not respond to God in thanksgiving. I think that's difficult. Thanking God for your broken arm. Thanking God for your, for your troubles. When I was in Pastor Jeff's church, there's a song that we sang there. Some words of that song. I've never heard it before, but I think it's a biblical song and I love it. Some words of the song says, Lord, I thank you for the troubles that I go through each and every day. Somehow later, so, so that I'm able to come before you and lay all my burdens before you and make them known to you. That is the Christian attitude that Paul wants us to know. That our tears should not drop down like useless water on, on a, on, in a desert. But that our tears as it were. When they come down, we know that God is there carrying them, carrying us. Knowing that He is in control. Thanking Him for all the situations that we have gone through, that we are going through even right now. Is that easy, church? No, Paul is not saying it is easy. That is why it requires faith. It requires trusting and relying upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says, the church should always rejoice. The church should always be a prayerful church. Ceaselessly pray to God and give thanks in all circumstances. Paul says we should try out, we should try not to worry about what we see, but cry out to God in all that is happening to us. That kind of attitude is the kind of attitude that will bring joy to us. Joy, church, is more than human happiness. The things that we cause each other to be happy about. But the joy of the Lord is more than that. This is the joy that leads to thanksgiving. The joy that floods your soul, even if when you go through a difficult time. But there's a joy that you experience in your heart. So Paul now brings then this contrast to the unneeded, unacceptable spirit of anxiety. If you look at your Bible, it says, but, or, you can, you can say, instead of but, or rather, you will find that in your, in your, I know you're using your ESV, your originals and the King James and so on, they have but before it says, let me see, maybe the ESV okay, yes, also have. Yes, but in everything, by prayer. But in everything, by prayer. So if he says, but, he says, rather, in everything, be thankful in God. Rather, in everything, in, in, instead of worrying, be thankful. It is easy to say those words when we are not going through a difficult time. But Paul is actually going through a difficult time. So Paul is speaking something that he knows. Paul is speaking something that he knows will carry the church. Rather be thankful than being worried. Be thankful in everything. It's difficult to swallow. It's not easy to be thankful in everything. But Paul says, church, be thankful in everything. Look back and be thankful of what God has done for us. As we mentioned earlier on, Barbaras was praying, he mentioned earlier on, regardless of the troubles that we have gone through as the church from the beginning of this year, there was not 
a time or a Sunday where we skipped worship. We came here, we worshiped God, we praised Him, we sang songs unto Him, we rejoiced together. So why worry? We just have to bring everything to God in prayer. So Paul wants the church to remind them that God is on their side, regardless of the situations that they are facing. They can be thankful to God even in the midst of death. You can be thankful to God even in the midst of death because God has given you the greatest gift. A gift that shines brighter than any brighter gift that you can have in this world. He has given us the gift of salvation. We praise the Lord for the salvation that he has given unto us. Why worry? Be thankful. So thankful, thankfulness then means that we acknowledge God's power. We acknowledge God's goodness and mercy in our lives. We thank him because God has given us or he has sent his son into the world. God has sent Jesus to die for us. We thank him. God quickens our spirit. We thank him. In other words, we were dead. Now we are alive. We were counted as those who were lost. Now we are counted as those who are found. We can thank God for all this. He gave us his gospel. Initially, we had the bad news of condemnation. But now we've got the good news of reconciliation. The good news of his unconditional love that he has for us. We thank God because of his restraining grace. God, in so much evil of this world, God has restrained some evil not to devour the church, not to devour your lives. He has put a stop, if you will, to some activities of the devil that the devil have wanted them to transpire in your life. We thank God for his restraining grace. He's protecting us. He's keeping us from falling each and every day. We thank God because of his love. It is because of his love that Satan is not running wild and, 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 and causing havoc into the house of God. He's not running wild and causing havoc in our lives. We thank God for that. We don't have to hunt him down. God deals with the things that we cannot deal with. God is in control. We thank him for that. We thank God for the daily provision that we have, the food that we eat, the health that we have. Even when we are not healthy, we are still alive. And if you, you, you're not going to receive your health in this life, you will still be healthy when you see him face to face. We thank God for the strength that he gives us, the strength to carry through, to carry us through. Paul says, remember, to thank God for his mercy. So when you thank God, thank God for his mercy of the past, but also ask for the blessings of the future. That is what it is to bring your prayers and thanks and supplications with thanksgiving, making your request known to God. That is what it is. You thank God for the mercies of the past, but you ask for future blessings. That is, it, that is why it is important, church, that we are a church that is prayerful, that we are a people that are able to pray. That's the only way to thank God for the mercies of the past and ask God for the blessings of the future. That is what the Apostle Paul is saying to us. So please notice, notice in that verse the emphasis made, the emphasis made that we should keep praying. Prayer is mentioned twice. A form of prayer, of course, but prayer is much mentioned twice. But I can actually say three times in that line. But in everything, in prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. That is the importance of prayer. That is the importance of being in communion, in union with God. Having this kind of a fellowship, a dialogue that you will have with God. So that you forget the cares of this life. Not because they don't exist. They exist, but they don't mean anything for you are in the hands of the living God. So there is that emphasis of prayer. There is that emphasis of thanksgiving in this verse. So we should keep praying. We should address God and never give up. 
doing all this with thanksgiving in our hearts. Even they they, 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 they not yet received the blessings of God, we thank Him because eventually we shall receive them. They are the so-called not yet received blessings, the blessings of tomorrow, the blessings of the future, the blessings of the coming year. We have not seen them, but we know that God has something in store for us. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to say you're going to have this kind of a year, you're going to have that kind of a year. That is blasphemy. How do I know that? But I know for sure that God has promised good to us. Regardless the, 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 the challenges of life, regardless the, the, the temporal sorrows that we will go through even in the next year, but there is good that God has promised us. So we thank God for the good that is to come. We thank God even for the trouble that is still to come for. It will bring us together. It will make us one people of God. That we pray together. The third thing that Paul says here, let God be God. Let God be God. I'll show you in what way is Paul saying this. In verse number 7, and the peace of God who surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Church, only when we let God be God in our lives, then we have God's peace in our lives. Only then. If God is not God in your life, God's peace will not reign in your life. If, in other words, you have one foot in the church, another one on the street, or we have one hope in God and another hope somewhere else, you're not going to experience the peace of God. You need to let God be God. In other words, you need to let God to take control of everything. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will flow into you, will run through your veins as it were, and fill your heart. That's why this is a statement which says, once you have received the blessings of God, you look at life differently. Once we have experienced the difficulties that pushes you to anxiety, you look at things differently. You know that there is God. That you kneel before God with, with thankfulness in your heart. You leave everything as it were in the hands of this faithful God. And then God's peace that guards your heart and your mind will overwhelm your life. So let God be God so that you do not become like the world. You don't grieve like like the world. So it is important that we do not only rejoice in receiving pardon from God. It is a good thing. It is a joyful thing to receive pardon from God. But we do not only rejoice in receiving pardon from God. We should cry out to God. We should call for peace within our hearts. There are many Christians who have received pardon from God. They do not have peace in their lives. We need to call for the peace of God to, to come upon our hearts, the absolute peace of God, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. God's peace, church, is necessary for every storm of our lives. God's peace, church, is necessary for every hill we will climb, for every mountain we will face, for every river we will cross, for every road we will travel, every situation and a journey that God will set before us. We need the peace of God to carry us through. In that way, we are able to face anxieties. Because for the peace of God, we need our minds to be stuck on God as it were. We need our hearts to cling to Him, to cling, to cling to His overflowing peace. Because when our minds are focused on God, there will be that peace flowing from Him, as it were, flowing from Him, running through our lives, running through our veins, and filling all those empty compartments of our hearts. The peace of God. Therefore, church, the peace that surpasses all understanding that Paul is talking about here is spiritual peace. It is not the peace that the world gives. It's not the peace that we fight for. It is not the peace that we stand on our toes and 
throw bombs and stones to one another for. This is spiritual peace. It is peace, the peace of mind, spiritual well-being of a person. It is the peace of the soul in a right standing with God. This is the peace that speaks in contrary to the fear of condemnation, in contrary to the fear of unworthiness. This is the peace that says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, and amen. amen. The peace of God that speaks to us in times of distress and perplexity. It is the peace that sets the mind free. It is the peace that sets the heart free. This is the peace that leads us to a healthy mind. The peace that springs forth from, from a person who will say, I do not conform to the standard of this world anymore, but my mind is renewed. That is the person who has the peace of God. This peace speaks of contentment. This, speak, this peace speaks of quietness within the soul, regardless of what is happening around you. Quietness of soul. I think that's the very ex experience that the, the, the disciples went through when Jesus cut the storm. When they, they thought they were dying, all of a sudden Jesus stood up, peace be still, and the storm was quiet. You can, you can imagine the quietness of the storm, but also feel or sense the quietness of the spirit that was troubled. They were crying out, Lord Jesus, we are dying. Peace, be still. That's why the psalmist says, be still and know I am God. That is when we have this peace of God. The peace that springs forth from, from a heart that is pardoned. This is the paradox of all Christianity church. That when all else is happening around you, we are able to say, if God is for us, who can be against us? We are able to look at the situation and see a better result than others will see. Therefore, this is not what many people do. Many people choose loneliness and call it peace. But this is the peace of God. Being in a situation where everything is happening, but have quietness of the spirit. Because God, you know that God is on, on your side. Therefore, church, the peace that surpasses all understanding is the peace that we need to carry us through. Even in these remaining days of the year, even as we look back and also look forward, we need this peace of God to carry us through to the coming, to coming year. Paul says then, let God be God. Let his peace flow through you. And the only way to achieve such peace is to be in Christ. It is impossible for a person who is outside the Lord Jesus Christ to achieve or experience this peace. That is why it should be impossible for those in Christ to not have experienced such peace or not fight hard to experience such peace, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. So now that we are in Christ, the only way to experience this peace is to be anxious about nothing. To be thankful in everything and make your request known to God. And then the peace of God, according to the Apostle Paul, will come and overwhelm your soul. Church, in the absence of peace, what is there? Fear. In the absence of peace, is doubt. That is why we are encouraged to have peace. That we may not fear the unknown. That we may not doubt if God is on our side. Because once we doubt that God is taking care of us, then we start looking around. Remember when Peter was walking on water and then he started to look around. He started to doubt. He started to, to, to feel that he's doing something that has never happened in his life. He looked on the situations and the people around him. He started to sink. It is when we move our focus, therefore, from God, when we start with worries that lead to hopelessness. There is no situation that God cannot resolve. That is what you need to take with you. No situation that God cannot, cannot resolve. 
So church, let me remind you before we greet each other our goodbyes. The only thing that has carried that has carried us through this year is the peace of God, which has flooded our souls. God's peace, which surpasses all understanding, that is what has carried us through even now. You may not have thought it that way, but for some reason God has given us peace. May it be the very same peace then that carries us through. May it be the same peace that looked out for us as life throws storms and everything unto us. Therefore, what will keep you from being a troubled soul because of the things that you have not achieved this year, because there are things that you wanted to achieve, but you have not achieved. So what will keep you then from being a troubled soul is the peace of God. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. The absolute peace of God that comes through believing and knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. This peace can be actually rejuvenated in your life by reading your Bible. You need to be in constant communion with God and that peace will make sense to you. Be friend with the word of God. What will rejuvenate this peace is singing hymns, biblical hymns that speak to your soul while this hymn addresses the Lord Jesus Christ. You will experience this peace of God. Remembering what Christ has done for you. Speaking to yourself good things like what the psalmist spoke to himself in Psalm 42. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, I shall praise him again, my God, my salvation. We must be able to speak to ourselves all the time. And actually, we do speak to ourselves more than we speak to anybody else. And when you are quiet, you are speaking to yourself. The question is, what is it that you are telling yourself? There are so many words you say to yourself when you are, even right now, we are speaking to yourself. But are you saying within yourself, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Hope in God. Are you constantly reminding your spirit to hope in God? Are you constantly reminding or building up your faith within you by looking up to Jesus on each and every day? That is the question that should remain with you as you keep talking to yourself. Are you, are you looking at the anxieties of life and then saying, I will worry about nothing but in prayer and supplication and, and thanksgiving, I will let my request be made known to God so that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will flood my soul like a river. Let me close like this. Do not allow anxiety to consume your heart. There's so much that you wanted to achieve perhaps this year. There's so much worries that you will still face in the few remaining days of this year. But let your anxieties not consume your heart. You might not have everything you have planned, but I can tell you one thing. God has given you everything that he has planned to give you this year. He does not fail. God will never leave or forsake us. He has given you everything he has planned to give this year. Some of the things that you want, perhaps he has planned to give you the following year. Perhaps he has not planned to give you at all. Have peace in this festive season. Not the peace of the world, but the peace of God. But how would you have the peace of God? By constantly tapping in to the word of God as it were. Reminding yourself of the good things that the Lord has done for you spiritually and also physically, that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will overwhelm your soul. May the peace of God surprise you even in times when you will have fallen into pieces. But because we are in, in such a constant communion and fellowship with God, may that peace of God surprise you that, wow, I should have fallen into pieces, but yet, I still have peace. Be thankful about everything. Be thankful in everything. That is the words of the Apostle Paul. About everything 
and in everything. In other words, stop complaining about what you do not have. Stop complaining about what you do not have. Be thankful that we have seen yet the end of another year. Most people have not seen the end of this year. We have. We still have an opportunity to plan and think, to plan things once again. We still have an opportunity to plan how and where the church should move. We still have an opportunity to pray to God, to be blessed by God, to experience all the blessings that comes from Him. Be thankful that this month also, December, reminds you of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why should we be thankful for that? Because should Jesus have not born in this world, you would still be in your sin. So we are thankful. Although his birth it may not be as important as his death, but we still are in, in a state of great, great thankfulness that he was born into this world. These things should remind, these are small things, but they should take away the anxieties of the year. Helping you to think and know that God can do better things and will do better things for you. Be thankful that you have a family. Maybe you have nothing in your family, but you still have a family. You must be thankful to God. Church, we are not here yet for a few weeks, but that does not mean you should divorce your Bible. That does not mean you should divorce speaking to God in prayer. Your prayer should not deteriorate to nothing. But you must keep the faith. You must experience peace. You must show peace as well. Because there will be so much challenges in this month. This month challenges many people. And we lose our cool, if you will. But blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. How will you fight anxiety? Or how will you face anxiety? Be content, be thankful, continue to make your request known to God. Let God be God and experience His peace. God bless you. Amen. Let us pray.